the part that Jesus began to say to the multitude concerning John. What did you have to what did you go out of the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. Good morning, brothers and sisters. If you would be getting a Bible out and turn it over to Numbers chapter 22, we're going to look at the passage that Noah read for us here in just a moment, so I'll put that back up on the board, but go ahead and get your Bibles over to Numbers 22. It's good to see everyone out this morning. We have several visitors, 15 of which is my family. We celebrated Lillian's one-year-old birthday party yesterday, so if you talk to anyone in my family, just don't believe anything they say about me, so just (laughs) ignore them after services. It's good to see you all today. We're going to be talking about reeds swaying in the wind from the passage we just read in Matthew chapter 11. And I want to begin the lesson this morning by talking about expectations. Uh, Expectations in certain situations. Uh, Just kind of get us warmed up to this. If, If you've ever had a need to go to a place like this, were there certain expectations when you walked into the emergency room? When, when you walked in and something was bleeding or you were hurting and you needed something real bad, there was a certain expectation when you walked in there that you were going to get the treatment and service that you deserved, right? Or what if, if, if your car broke down and you had it towed to a particular mechanic or maybe a trusted mechanic and you take it in there and, and they have the, the, the ability to work on it and they've got the car jack and they lift it up. There's a certain expectation that these people, if you take it to a place like this, they're going to be able to fix it, right? But you know, expectations actually change depending on the location. I'll illustrate that another way. Like, for instance, if you, if you walked into this dining room, this is a McDonald's, by the way. I know I probably didn't need to point that out. A lot of people knew that. You have certain expectations when you go into that McDonald's, right? But those expectations are very different if you go to St. Elmo's uh, Steakhouse in downtown Indianapolis, right? <laughs> I mean, my, my dining experience, and the only reason we got to go to St. Elmo's is because someone gave us a gift card that was given to them. There were two completely different uh, experiences from the McDonald's dining room and the St. Elmo's, right? Your expectations are different depending on where you are. Let me ask you this morning, when you walked into this building, what was your expectation? What was your expectation when you saw me walk up here? And you knew it was time for the sermon. And you know, it's, it's time. We're, we're going to spend about 30 to 40 minutes here just, just looking at the Bible. What's your expectation for what happens in this context? We all have expectations in those situations. And brethren, let me tell you, that's kind of what Jesus is getting at in this passage in Matthew 11. When he's talking about John the baptizer, he's asking the people, what did you expect? When you went out and heard that there was a preacher, a prophet in the wilderness, what did you expect to see when you got out there? Did you expect to see a bunch of reeds swaying in the wind? Did you expect to see a man dressed in soft clothes? He's not going to be out there in the wilderness. That that guy is in the royal palaces, Jesus said. But John the Baptist is out there in the wilderness, and I tell you, he said, he is more than a prophet. And the reason why I want to bring our attention to this passage and think a little bit about this phrase, reed swaying in the wind, is because let me tell you, brethren, that's exactly what a lot of people want out of a prophet. They want a preacher or a prophet who's a reed swaying in the wind. Sometimes people say they want to know what God's will is, but what they really want is a reed swaying in the wind. Someone that is easily influenced by outward circumstances. Someone who's being influenced by the wind of influence, by the culture, and by the waves of what's going on in the world. That's what changes and dictates the message. And brethren, did you know, in the Old Testament, that happens a lot. There are prophets all over the Old Testament who were reeds swaying in the wind. And it is my hope this morning to bring you a sampling of some of those, because it's an overwhelming study in the Old Testament. So we're going to look at some prophets who were like these reeds swaying in the wind this morning. And I just want to go ahead and head this off. As we use the word prophet this morning, I think it's helpful to understand we're not just talking about people who tell the future, okay? 
In the Old Testament, that was certainly the case. They, they would come in and they would say, if you do not change, X, Y, or Z is going to happen in so much time. And, and in that way, I guess they were future telling. But really, a prophet was doing more than just future telling. He was preaching. He was begging and pleading with God's people to repent, to do the right thing, to change so that these things don't come and happen to you. So here's what I want to start with. I want to start with the story of Balaam. I think this is a really cool story. And I want to start with just making the point that there were prophets in the Old Testament who changed their message. And you might ask, well, why is that? Why were prophets tempted to change the message that God gave them? And I think Balaam is a wonderful starting place. So I'm going to bring us up to speed a little bit here as we look at Numbers 22. We're in a section of Israel's history where they are still wandering in the wilderness, okay? They wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And the narrative of Numbers actually stops telling us about the Israelites and takes a time out and says, now I want to tell you about this guy who was trying to curse the people of God. And this man's name was actually Balak. He was the king of Moab. And in Numbers 22 and verse 1, the Bible tells us that the Israelites had traveled and camped in the plains of Moab near the Jordan. And Balak, son of Zippor, in verse 2, saw all that the Israelites had done to the Amorites. And Moab was terrified of the people because they were numerous. And so Balak devises a plan. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get this guy named Balaam. I hear he has a really good track record for cursing people. And so I'm going to offer him a bunch of money and get him to come and curse those people of Yahweh, the Israelites, so that I don't have to worry about them. And in verse 6, the Bible tells us, he, he sends these messengers and he says, please come and put a curse on these people for me because they are more powerful than I am. I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that those you bless are blessed and those you curse are cursed. And so in verse 7, the elders of Moab and Midian, they depart with fees for divination in hand and they come to Balaam and report Balak's words to him. And in verse 8, he said, spend the night here and I will give you the answer the Lord tells me. So the officials stayed with Balaam. Can you see the eagerness in Balaam's eyes? I want you to imagine the riches and the, the things that they bring to offer Balaam to come. Come, come over here tomorrow. Curse God's people. And imagine just Balaam's eyes getting bigger and bigger. But what is it that Balaam should know if he's a real prophet of Yahweh? Is God really going to allow him to curse his people? I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. I mean, this is Genesis 12, right? The promises to Abraham. What was the third one? I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. No, God's not going to allow one of his prophets to curse these people. And yet you see Balaam will just stay the night with me. And let me ask God. Maybe he'll let me go. Maybe he'll let me get this prophet that I so desire. And I don't know if you've ever read the text this way, but I, th I find it hilarious that that night God comes to Balaam and in verse 9, God asks one question. Who are these men with you? <laughs> I think that's as if God is saying, you already know the answer to this. And of course, Balaam, he Answers God, it's, it's Balak, the king of Moab. They want me to come curse the people. And God says in verse 12, you're not to go with them. You're not to curse this people. They are blessed. What are you talking about? No, you cannot go with them. And so the next morning in verse 13, Balaam gets up and he says, go back to your land. The Lord has refused to let me go with you. You know, many people have read Balaam's story as actually a positive story. That is not the way to read Numbers 22. Let me tell you, we're going to look at some New Testament passages later. I'll reference them. that make it clear, Balaam is no prophet we should be praising. This is somebody who wanted to profit off of being a prophet, if that makes sense. That's what was motivating him. And so, to make matters worse, they go back to Balak and they tell him what Balaam said. And he says, send more money. Go again. Tell him how badly we need him. And so here they come back again over there to Balaam. And you look down in verse, uh, verse 15. Balak had sent them again. 
And in verse uh, 17, he says, I will greatly honor you and do whatever you ask. And in verse 18, Balaam responded to the servants of Balak, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go against the command of the Lord my God to do anything small or great. Sounds great. It looks like Balaam, he's on the page, same page with God. But look what he does in verse 19. Please stay here overnight, as the other did, so that I may find out what else the Lord has to tell me. You kind of hear it in Balaam's voice. He, he's hoping that God will change his mind so that he can go and get this prophet. And so the story actually takes an interesting turn. God comes back to Balaam that second time and says, you know what? Fine, go. If that's what you want to do, go on ahead, Balaam. March yourself down there to Moab and do what you want. So Balaam saddles his donkey. And to me, probably one of the most humorous things in the Bible, except maybe not to Balaam, as he's riding his donkey, his donkey actually opens his mouth and begins to talk with him. And, and as he's striking his donkey and is mad at it because it won't go the way he wants it to, he's conversing back and forth with his donkey as if it's something he does every day. And then the Lord opens Balaam's eyes and he sees that there was this angel of the Lord standing there. And I think this whole story of this donkey talking is actually there to show us that it's actually Balaam who's the donkey here. His donkey has more sense than he does. And so Balaam makes his way to the land of Moab and he makes it clear to the king I can literally only say what my Lord puts in my mouth. And so four times in chapter 23 and in chapter 24 of Numbers, Balaam opens up his mouth and gives, uh, gives blessings to God's people instead of curses. But here's the reason I bring this here. Balaam is somebody who is motivated by money. Wanting to change the wishes and the desires and what God has to say in, a, in an attempt for personal gain. Balaam is no harrowing story. If you go to 2 Peter 2.15, Jude 11, Revelation 2.14, these are all New Testament passages that see Balaam as a straying and selfish pro, uh, false prophet who is after money. Let me show you another example in Scriptures. Turn your Bibles over to the Minor Prophets. Can you turn your Bibles over to the book of Micah? Look over at Micah chapter 2. Micah chapter 2. And as you're trying to find that, because I know it's tricky, I get to cheat. I have my little Bible marker already on it. Micah chapter 2. I want to give you a little cheat sheet here. If you're ever curious to know when a prophet was prophesying, Normally, chapter 1 and verse 1 of the Minor Prophets will tell you who were the kings in those days. So if you just peek over at Micah 1 and verse 1, it tells us that he was prophesying uh, when he saw regarding Samaria and Jerusalem in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. That's not true of every one of the Minor Prophets, but many of them will give you when the king or who the kings were when they were serving. But in these days, the southern tribe would have seen the northern tribes carried off into uh, captivity of the Assyrians. And to no surprise, there's turmoil among God's people whenever this is going on. And let me tell you, whenever there's turmoil among God's people, popular preachers begin to pop up. People that everyone wants to listen to, there's a reason why. And if you look down in chapter 2 and verse 6, actually, this is what these people are saying to Micah. Quit your preaching, they preach. They should not preach these things. Shame will not overtake us. That's how people are acting. And to be more specific, look at what it says down in verse 11 of Micah 2. If a man comes and utters empty lies and says, I will preach to you about wine and beer, he would be just the preacher for this people. They want a preacher to lie to them. Preach to us about wine and beer. And by the way, you don't need to tell me this. I know that there are churches out there that preach this very message of wine and beer. That's okay. Drunkenness is fine. Have it in moderation and everything's good. There are preachers of wine and beer today. But let me tell you this. What I'm trying to point out is that the preacher, the prophets, they will preach whatever is popular. It might not be beer and wine, but it might be what just sounds good to everybody else. What are people wanting to hear? And in that way, they become reeds 
swaying in the wind. Let me show you another passage here in Micah. Look at Micah chapter 3 and verse 5. Micah 3 and verse 5. This is what the Lord says concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who proclaim peace when they have food to sink their teeth into, but declare war against the ones who puts nothing in their mouth. Where is their motivation coming from? When I have the food to sink my teeth into, that's when I'll preach peace, they say. But the second you don't pay me or give me what I want, that's when I will proclaim war. God says in verse 6, Therefore it will be night for you without visions. It will grow dark for you without divination. The sun will set on these prophets and the daylight will turn black over them. Then the seers will be ashamed and the diviners disappointed and they will all cover their mouths because there will be no answer from God. Rest assured, this kind of preaching to the masses, preaching what's popular, it will come to an end. God knows how to do that. And there will come a time that these prophets will have to cover their mouths because there is nothing from God anymore. And maybe tied and similar to that, we have these prophets who aren't just seeking popularity and preaching what's popularity, these prophets who are just prophets for the people. One more passage here, Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Similar to the days of Micah, in Isaiah chapter 30, in verse 9, it says that they are rebellious people, deceptive children, children who do not want to listen to the Lord's instruction. And they say to the seers, do not see. And to the prophets, do not prophesy uh, the truth to us. Tell us flattering things. Prophesy illusions. Get out of the way. Leave the pathway. Rid us of the Holy One of Israel. Is this not a sad thing to think about God's people saying? Lie to me. I don't want to hear the truth anymore. But then to finally turn around, look at the prophet and say, and while you're at it, tell God to go away. Rid us of the Holy One of Israel. You know, it's interesting to me that they associate the preaching of God's Word with his presence. Don't speak the truth to us, therefore God will go away. But that actually does make sense. Because when we hear God's voice and we gather regularly to listen to it, should that not make us acutely aware to the fact that he dwells with us and he is here and he is present? And so what does it look like in our generation? to say to God and to say to the prophets and preachers, don't tell us the truth. Well, let me give you a few ways I think that sounds to me. Brother, you preach too much on God's wrath. We need to hear more messages on the mercy and on the grace and the love of God. Stop preaching about those kinds of things. Let me say this. Sometimes I think that comes from a place of sincerity. There needs to be a balance in our pulpits, and I think it's fair to say in every congregation there has been a time where maybe it's been too heavy-handed one way. But if we ever thought, maybe there's a reason for that. that we need to be woken up. We need to be thinking about those kinds of things. And that's why the preacher is talking about those things. And, and the balance that comes in is there to help us land exactly where we need to be. And maybe when we say things like that, it's because really we just don't want to hear those kinds of lessons. Maybe we hear someone say something like this, issues of fellowship should not go beyond one key issue. Do we both love Jesus? That's all should really matter about fellowship. Do, do we both love Jesus? Well, again, that, that sounds good on the surface. That sounds like something a prophet for the people would say. But we know through a reading of Galatians and 1 John that there are other key issues of fellowship not just if we love Jesus. It doesn't really matter how I worship God. Should it, should it matter if we use instruments in our worship? Should it matter if I do this or that or the other? You see, these kinds of questions and this kind of attitude, I actually think comes up from a place of being a prophet of the people. And it's in these ways that the preachers become the prophets for the people and not for God. And so Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, what are they going to do? They're going to multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They'll turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside 
to Miz. They'll find a prophet. They'll find a preacher for the people. They're out there. We give them enough money, they'll say what we want to. But then thirdly, or secondly rather, we have prophets who are making up the message in the Old Testament. A little bit different than what we've been talking about. The prophets who changed the message, it was typically because of an outside influence, money or fame or something like that. But in the days of Ezekiel, turn your Bibles over to Ezekiel 13, I want to show you a passage where it makes it clear there were some prophets who were just preaching out of their own imagination. Ezekiel 13 and verse 1 the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets, Israel, are like jackals among ruins. Brethren, these are really just prophets who are prophesying out of opportunity. Like a jackal among the ruins. The idea is the jackals aren't there if the ruins aren't there, but when the ruins are there, that's when they come in. It's kind of like the idea of a vulture coming to swoop in and get the prey. In verse 5, Ezekiel says, You did not go up to the gap to restore the wall around the house of Israel so that it might stand in the battle of the day of the Lord. These prophets, they're not getting involved with God's people. But instead, in verse 6, they see false divinations and false visions they're a lie, and they claim this is the Lord's declaration when the Lord did not send them, and yet they wait for the fulfillment of their message. The people are anticipating these, these prophets, things to come true, and they never really do. Verses 15, or 18 and 19, rather, tell us about prophetesses, the, the women prophets in that day. They're doing something interesting. They're prophesying out of their own imagination in verse 17, but in verse 18... It tells us, woe to the women who sew magic bands on the wrist of every hand and who make veils for the heads of people of every size in order to ensnare lives. Will you ensnare the lives of my people but preserve your own? You profane me among my people for handfuls of barley and scraps of bread, and you put, uh, put those to death who should not die and spare those who should not live when you lie to my people who listens to lies. This is pretty foreign to us. This is some kind of a occult practice that these women were doing. They had these magic bands and these other things on. What I find interesting is this whole handful of barley that it's talking about in verse 19. The best we can tell what was going on here is that these prophetesses, you would walk up, you would take a handful of barley, and they would read, I guess, the barley, and they would determine if you should live or die from the scoop of barley you made. And God said, the ones who are righteous, you're killing. The ones who aren't righteous, you're not killing. Because you're prophesying from lies. You know what God says about these false prophets? Down in verse 10, He says that as they were leading them astray by saying peace when there was none, He says, And since when a flimsy wall is being, will, uh, being built, they plaster it with whitewash, therefore tell those plastering it with whitewash that it will fall. Torrential rain will come. The hailstones will plunge down. The whirlwind will be Release. These prophets are whitewashed walls. There's nothing behind them. They're not backed off of God. And the second a little bit of pressure gets pushed up against them, they will fall flat. And that is certainly what God is going to do to them. We have prophets who are making up the message. But the last point I want to leave us with this morning is that it's not just the prophets who are guilty here. There might be false prophets out there who are saying these kinds of things, but there is more layers to this. There are people who are ignoring good messages. There are people who are ignoring the good prophets. And I want to look at three ways they were doing that in the Old Testament. Turn your Bibles over to 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings 22. I'm going to very briefly kind of run us through this story, and we'll draw some applications, and the lesson will be mine and yours. This is in the days of Jehoshaphat. He was the king of Judah. And Ahab was the king of Israel. And if there's one big important thing I want you to remember as we highlight this story, it's that Ahab was a wicked king. Very, very bad king, all right? And Jehoshaphat knew that. And Ahab is pretty concerned about the land of Aram. And he goes uh, in verse 3 to his servants. Ahab does, and he says, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead is ours? But we're doing nothing to take it from the king of Aram. <laughs> 
And in verse 4, he goes to Jehoshaphat and says, will you go with me to fight Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat replied to the king, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses and your houses. Wow, that was pretty quick there, Jehoshaphat. He just signed up. Yeah, I'll go. But then what does he do? In verse 5, he says, well, first, let me ask what the Lord's will is. (laughs) Kind of got that backwards, didn't he? And so the king of Israel says, yeah, no problem. And he parades in all of his prophets. He says, look at all these guys. We'll pick any of them. We'll use all of them. Let's see what they have to say. And of course, all these guys presumably are on uh, Ahab's payroll. And so they all say, yep, the land is yours. Go take it. And Jehoshaphat is a little bit skeptical of that. And he says, are you sure you don't have any other prophets that we can hear from? Just, just, one, just one other prophet. And Ahab says, well, there's this one guy, but he never says anything favorable to me. He never says anything that I like, and every time he prophesies for me, it just is always doom and gloom. His name is Micaiah. And Jehoshaphat says, let's hear from that guy. And the text plays it out really funny. They they send for Micaiah, and when the people go to get Micaiah, look down at verse 13 and look what they say. Look, the words of the prophets are are unanimously favorable for the king. So let your words be theirs and speak favorably. They say to Micaiah, they coach him. Listen, you say everything we said, okay? And so Micaiah does. Micaiah gets there, and the king asks, should we go to Ramoth Gilead for war? And Micaiah said, march up and succeed. The Lord will hand it over to the king. You might wonder, how do I know that was his inflection? Because the king in verse 16 says, how many times must I make you swear not to tell me anything but the truth in the name of the Lord? I think Micaiah says this dripping with sarcasm. You know what? If this is what you want to hear, sure, they told me to tell you this. Go on up. See what happens. And as soon as Ahab rebukes him for this, Micaiah turns around and says, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, they have no master. Let everyone return home in peace. Ahab will be this shepherd that's scattered that he's talking about. And let me tell you, that's exactly how that goes. They go into that battle. Jehoshaphat dresses up like Ahab. I don't know how he got that short end of the stick. And there's an archer who just fires at random. And it happens to find Ahab right in between his armor. But what is my point for this whole story? What had Ahab been doing his entire life with these prophets? He'd been ignoring the message. Doing what he wanted to do. And as funny as it is to just sit here and laugh at Ahab and say, that's so silly. Brethren, have we ever been guilty of that? to sit here and listen to a message, to listen to a sermon, to open up our Bible and read it, and we hear this message, and we sit there and think, I need to change, but we just don't do it. We ignore it. And we look for anyone else who can tell us something different. It was no different in the days of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 6.16, this is what the Lord says, Stand by the roadways and look. Ask about the ancient past. Which is the way to what is good? Then take it and find rest for yourselves. But they protested. We won't. (laughs) And I appointed watchmen over you and said, Listen for the sound of the ram's horns. But they protested. We won't listen. That's sometimes what we do as well. Just turn my ears off. You know, there's two ways not to listen. One way I'm more guilty of than I should be. Husbands, have you ever been working on something and your wife is talking to you and you're listening to her, but you're not really listening, listening to her? That's this way. And we do that to God's word. We listen, but we don't listen, listen. But then there's one more way we don't listen. And that's in Amos chapter 7. Turn your Bibles there, the last passage we'll look at. Amos chapter 7. And actually back up a little bit down to verse 10. When we're told about a priest of God named Amaziah. Uh, Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to King Jeroboam of Israel saying, Amos has conspired against you right here in the house of Israel. The land cannot endure all his words. For Amos has said, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. 
And in verse 12, Amaziah said to Amos, Go away, you seer. Flee to the land of Judah, earn your living, and give your prophecies there. But don't ever prophesy at Bethel again, for, it's the ki- uh, for it is the king's sanctuary and a royal temple. Let me tell you the second way we can stop listening. We can tell God's word, or we can tell the messenger to get out. I don't want to hear this anymore. I'm done. Don't talk to me about that again. Run off the prophet. Leave. Let me tell you, I've known of congregations that have done that to preachers and elders and men who are trying to stand up for what's right. Just leave. You're fired. We don't want to hear you anymore. If it was happening in the Old Testament, it can certainly happen in our day as well. Three brief applications this morning. Number one, we cannot change the message. We have to change ourselves. Now, we can do all we want to try and change the message. You can try to, you can try to pay me more money. It ain't going to work. <laughs> you, you, you can try to give the preacher all the fame and all the glory that he wants. You can let him preach from his own imagination. You can let him preach the things that are popular to say, what everyone else is saying. And, and maybe the preacher can give in to all those things. But let me ask you, at the end of the day, does that really change what the message is? And does that change you? That's up to us. We have to be determined to make those changes, no matter what the preacher is up here saying. Secondly, we need to know false preaching when we hear it. I like 1 John 4, 1 for this point. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. Test them. We don't just let anyone stand up here. I I think everyone knows that. There's a reason for that. You have to be tested. Will you say what's true and right? Don't settle for a reed swaying in the wind up here. Because when people want weak preaching, they can get it. So let's go back to the beginning of the sermon. When we talked about what did you expect when I stood up here? What do you expect when someone stands up here? What do you expect when someone begins to teach you? It better be a high standard. Because it's a high standard we're trying to live up to. And then lastly, we can't be reeds swaying in the wind. First and foremost is Christians. Is that how you would describe your life? Just a reed out there in the wind, and all of the world's influences and culture is just blowing you around? That's not what Jesus wants for you. He wants you to be firmly grounded in Him. It's time to wake up. Stop letting the wind push you around. What about husbands and wives? Husbands, who's running the ship at home? Is it you? Or is your family blown around in the wind because you're never there? And because you won't make the decisions that you need to? Because you won't make the sacrifices necessary to help ground your family in the Lord. Because let me tell you, if you don't do that, someone else would love to influence your children. Someone would love to influence your wife. Get busy today. Wives and mothers, you get busy too. Uphold your husbands. Help them accomplish that task. The last question this morning is, are you a reed swaying in the wind? You need to turn things around Root yourself in Jesus today. There might be a few ways you need to do that. You might be a Christian. I realize this lesson was primarily aimed at the Christian. Then please recommit yourself. We give an opportunity after the song, or during the song rather, you're allowed to come and ask for prayers and confess sin. That's what that moment is for, is for recommitment. But maybe you're in the audience and you have not started this journey. You've been thinking about it, but you're not there yet then you are just a reed swaying in the wind. Ground yourself in Jesus today. So if that means you need to be baptized, we want to help you with that. If we can help you in any way, won't you come now as we stand and as we sing?